Everybody wants to know how the offensive line is going to shake out for the Dolphins this season, so I spent all of today's practice with my eyes trained on the big guys up front. Here's what I found here today on Locked on Dolphins. You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami, welcome to another episode of Locked on Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked on Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked on Dolphins, co-host of Locked on NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Tip of the cap to our everydayers because it is your team every day. We don't just say it. We live it here on the Locked On Network. Today's episode of Locked On Dolphins is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as the playoffs have wound down. The sports stop sporting the way that we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking all customers up with a boost or bonus daily. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Uh, officially a week into training camp. The Dolphins reported a week from yesterday or a week from today, I should say. They've had six training camp practices. Uh, They're off tomorrow, which gives us an opportunity through the first week to kind of zoom out and look at everything from a big picture perspective. And uh, because we had the extra show coming tomorrow with no practice, I wanted to take the opportunity today to get really deep dive nitty gritty into uh, the storyline that everybody always wants to talk about. Uh, and it's not to a tongue of a low and thankfully the contract situation's done. So that, that storyline is swept away, right? Everybody wants to know about the offensive line. How are the guard spots going to shake out? Is, is the play going to be better than it was last year? How can Miami overcome uh, what is perceived to be limitations there? So I have my practice notes for today and there's a lot of them. If you're watching on YouTube, those are all about the offensive line. Every single notation on here is about the offensive line. This is an offensive line specific show. Now we can go through some of the surface level highlights first. We had our first scrap at practice between Jalen Wright and Cater Kohu. Uh, looked like Cater was a little hot based on how Jalen Wright finished a run in one of the team periods towards the end of practice. Patrick Paul gets in there and just a massive human being. He kind of picks up and moves Cater off to the side. So that was uh, it was really entertaining to to see the the fire that these guys had in their belly today. Uh, it was a competitive practice. It was still sloppy in some cases, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about the the procedural stuff as a part of our notes that we have here for uh, the offensive line and its performance throughout the course of practice because Teron Armstead touched on it, and Teron Armstead gave some great insight, particularly with the guys at the top. I will say this. Uh, the vast majority of the snap issues that you are seeing or hearing or reading about – uh, they're coming from Ireland Brown, and they're coming from Andrew Meyer, the two UDFA centers that are on this roster. Uh, Jack, Jack, Jack Driscoll played right guard today next to Andrew Meyer the entire time. Um, I believe somebody had mixed those two guys up in one shot. I think somebody mixed up one of the snap issues with Ireland Brown with, a, with an issue with Aaron Brewer. Um, it's, there's a lot happening in a very short amount of time and everybody only gets a chance to see it once because it's all live and you're sitting in the stands. So I, I understand hearing the storyline of it, but particularly with the starters, here's what Teron Armstead had to say when he was asked about the snap mechanic issues for the dolphins early in training camp, uh, and where they go from here as Tua and Aaron, Bre Aaron Brewer did have one misfired snap in today's practice after the ball was on the ground a couple of times on yesterday's practice. Um, uh, those, the, the starters specifically too, and AB, they just get more time on task, get more reps. It's, it's different. I, we, I was actually talking to about it yesterday and he was kind of explaining the differences between like AB snap point compared to Connors or Liam is all different. So maybe he got a squat or reach or, you know, but that, that only comes with time. So the more they get those reps, which they are, and, and those will get cleaned up and disappear. But early in camp, you see some mis mishaps like that and some operational issues. Okay. And the operational issues um, were a thing. It kind of made for a clunky practice in some ways. But again, it, it's Andrew Meyer hiking a snap that goes over Skylar Thompson's head and shotgun, right? It's um, Mike White has to dribble the ball 
off the ground in order to get the ball back up to then hand the ball off in a short yardage run type situation. Uh, so now that Teron Armstead kind of shed a little bit of light on, on Tua and Brewer and their individual exchange, I'll be something I'm looking forward to, to looking for when the team is back on the practice field on Thursday to see uh, how exactly Tua is getting up underneath of center to be able to receive the handoffs and see uh, what he may do differently versus what's been put on tape in years past. But uh, I do want to go through some of the, the standouts that I had. There's some defensive line notes in here. Uh, because everything was was guys that had success against guys across from each other. I thought Brewer had his best practice, and I watched him closely. They went mid red zone. Uh, they they were on the seven yard line, the eight yard line, uh, and, and working uh, kind of interchanged personnel groupings as far as guys you would assume would be starters with guys that you would assume are competing for roster spots. So it's all still kind of interchanged. There is some consistency with the offensive line groupings and who's playing next to who, or at least there was today. But um, Brewer had a really nice block one-on-one -on -one with Benito Jones in the run game, right? And that's the concern that everybody has with Brewer is he's a smaller center. How much power does he have? Can he handle one-on-one -on -one blocks? And Benito Jones isn't the most explosive or dynamic guy, but he's a powerful dude. And there's a lot of guys on this Dolphins roster. Neville Gallimore, I have power. I have complimentary notes for his power uh, and what he can do as a pass rusher, as a guy who put on some weight. Uh, I have notes down here that Tier Tart completely overwhelmed Lester Cotton in a one-on-one -on -one pass rush rep. Uh, so th there's there's guys with power, and Benito with his build is right up at the top. And Brewer set the hook on the block that sprung Achan for a, a touchdown run from the eight-yard line on an inside run. And it was really impressive to see him get leverage, stay low, use his hands, utilize his agility to, to, to create the angle and seal the block and allow HN to run up inside of it. So um, I thought that was a really nice, good, good rep from him. Uh, I thought Brew had a couple of really good reps in one-on-one -on -one pass rush situation. Uh, they, they went one-on-ones after they did a walkthrough indie period install uh, they did wide receiver DB one-on-ones and they did O-line D-line one-on-ones. And my eyes were on the O-line D-line one-on-ones the entire time. Uh, Patrick Paul, complimentary notes for his angles. Um, Brewer leverage on consecutive reps. Sat down really well on his hips. Showcased good feet and redirection ability. Once he got his hands on, it was kind of effortless to see him kind of flash and mirror. Uh, I think there are maybe opportunities for him to get tested with more dynamic guys. And what the Dolphins have with their interior A gap rushers right now, uh, but that that remains to be seen. I, I thought Liam Eichenberg had a really nice pass set on Calais Campbell in a one on one situation, where Liam so often it feels like a lot of his balance stuff is when either the the base gets too wide or he overextends himself, and it wasn't just a rep of well he he won the angle at first and just washed him out. He actually did a nice job setting the frame and then shooting his hands and getting his hands on Campbell and staying low to make sure he didn't get too tall or get pulled off his set or anything like that. And, and I appreciated that rep from Liam uh, a great deal because that's it showcased some elements of his game that have been consistent issues that he was able to harness within that individual rep and show it well. Now, that's not to say that anybody came out here and had a perfect day, right? There were opportunities in short yardage runs where Calais Campbell and Jordan Poyer are stacking up the point of attack on a third and one run when the team went short yardage. And they, they went pretty close to live. They went thump. So there was some good contact with these guys. Um, and then there, there's other opportunities where, depending on what the defense is presenting or if they're bringing extra rushers or if they're fourth rushers coming from somebody that's not a traditional for rusher alignment for the guys on the, the defensive line. And all that stuff happened today. Um, you saw some, some runs off the edge that the offense would have to throw hot off of. You probably saw some pressures that in a, a game situation when you weren't executing install, uh, they would have changed the player. They, maybe they flip, the, flip it over and, and run it to the other side. Um, or they, they have a kill as far as getting up to the line of scrimmage. But in install, you're trying to execute 
the play against different kinds of fronts and pressures and, and looks and see how the guys sort it out and how they are grasping the concept of the different ways that you have to block the same play against different fronts. Right. So I don't read too much into that element of it. Uh, and, and I tried to be as individual rep focused as I could be in today's practice because the individual reps are the, the cohesiveness is going to come and the, the cohesiveness and consistency of what we're calling against certain looks is not just going to be offense has a practice script with install and defense has a practice script with install. Uh, just run it right. Like we're each running the third play on our scripts and we'll go from there. A few more notes uh, and then we'll dive into uh, Mike McDaniel. I had a chance to ask him a question at his press availability before practice today. We'll get into all that next year on Locked on Dolphins. Stick with us. Listen, we all love sports, which makes when they stop all that much more difficult. Uh, the playoffs wound down this summer, so there's fewer games to watch on TV and the sports aren't sporting like we want them to, but FanDuel keeps the sports going Whenever you want, all you have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. This summer, FanDuel is hooking all customers up with a boost or bonus daily. There is something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Let me rip through some more of these notes here. Uh, Jack Driscoll had a really nice block on the edge against Quentin Bell. Um, they ran power pass, which is where you pull the guard to emulate run game. There's a run fake and the guard ends up blocking the end man on line of scrimmage to help set the integrity of the pocket. Right. But it looks like to linebackers, it looks like run with power. So I got to get down in there and then it's, Oh shoot. He's blocking the end guy on line of scrimmage. I got to go get my depth and ideally the ball's out. Uh, but he did a really nice job. Jack Driscoll on that play attaching in space and getting attached to a defender and sustaining the integrity of the depth and width of the pocket with that individual rep. That stood out to me uh, in a good way as well. Let's see. We had a lot of complimentary Chop Robinson first step explosiveness notes. Once again, it's, it's a daily tradition on the show, it seems, that we get Chop Robinson blowing up reps. Uh, he had one rep. I believe this play was illegally recorded and posted somewhere on the internet. I'm not going to share it. But if you wanted to, you could probably find it. And he was to the quarterback in under two seconds. <laughs> now, part of that is because of the Dolphins' defense and its presentation is they have guys walked up at or near the line of scrimmage in interior gaps and it forces the tackle to step down in order to honor, I need to protect the inside gaps first, and if that second-level defender comes down like he's kind of walked up in, that's going to give a, a, another player in the B gap a free run through the gap. So I have to honor that first. Um, and, and them sorting all of those calls out is a part of the process of, of getting back into the swing of things against the different looks in training camp. Right. So chop being, uh, somebody who was a beneficiary of that is hard to ignore because that's going to be part of the game plan. That's part of the book on this defense is when we say simulated pressures, it looks like we're bringing pressure. It looks like we're bringing more than four. But in reality, we're not bringing more than four. But where do we bring the four from? Do you bring an untraditional rusher to change the math on either side if they go uh, slide protection that's not full slide? If they go six-man protection and they say, hey, the center step into this guy and the two offensive linemen on the backside have to sort out the three guys with the back on who comes. What happens if all three comes but uh, the defensive lineman crosses the face of the center? So now he's... You know, you could do the chess match all the way up and down, all the gaps up front, depending on who you, where you guys line guys up at and whether or not they choose to come. That, in turn, has a domino effect for what your first step is going to be offensively. But for Chop to have the explosiveness to take advantage of that, and you think about JP, and you think about Chubb, like it's not a coincidence that Emmanuel Agua has splashed in the way that he has um, in a way that was kind of similar to how he splashed when he was playing for Josh Boyer and Brian Flores. 
but they did the same thing. But more often than not, they just really brought everybody. Right. So, um, Patrick Paul on here, uh, for good wash inside stepping down, creating some space. I have Aaron Brewer on a screen, getting outside the numbers with very good range. I have, uh, Brewer picking up a pick stunt with a three-man game to be able to really pin the, the stunt man inside and not allow anybody to loop back around and get up into an interior gap. Um, I'll tell you what, Quentin Bell, <laughs> this name also gets brought up in every single practice. And in period seven, for my notes, which was one of the team periods, um, Bell, two pressures on Patrick Paul, utilizing power. And, and that's for, for Patrick Paul when he talked yesterday. He said one of the big points of emphasis and reminders was just keeping your pads down, right? When you're naturally a big tackle like that, that it can be very easy to kind of lose your leverage there. Uh, so to see Quentin Bell and Michael Mike McDaniel was very complimentary of Quentin Bell when he was asked about him in the pre-practice press availability uh, for what he has done with the opportunity that he's been afforded and uh, kind of taking the bull by the horns and seizing the moment. Speaking of Mike McDaniel, I know everybody has questions about the guards and the interior guys and, and positional, like who lands in what spots and, you know, taking Connor Williams and starting taking him from guard and moving him to center and Lee Meikenberg playing guard and being the backup center last year. And Jack Driscoll's got all these different spots he can line up and all these combinations of guys, right? Everybody kind of wants to know how it's going to shake out. Everybody's trying to get a feel for, um, what the offensive line is going to look like. So I asked Mike McDaniel today, I asked him, how do you find the balance of cross training guys versus giving guys reps in a singular spot to prep them for a spot to play in season? Here's what Mike McDaniel had to say. This time of year, you see a lot of cross training on the offensive line. How do you find the balance of those reps and guys getting exposed to multiple spots versus maybe getting all of their reps in a singular spot to best prep them where they, they may play in season? Well, I think, I think when, when you're going through that process um, and there's, you know, it, it's different for people at different stages of the career. If, if you've earned a starting spot and you're a starter, um, you, you have less, um, necessity to be as versatile if you're um, and, and that so you'll be in one spot probably the whole time um, a lot of jobs uh, particularly with us where we have a lot of competition um, when those are up in the air you you do need to give guys an opportunity to make the team and that may be as a starter or position versatility is absolutely paramount if you aren't starting um, because, you know, we can't um, dictate the terms on, on injuries in general um, and where those opportunities will present themselves. So you have to give them an opportunity to make the team um, if they're uh, in, in the competition mode for their, for their role. And then eventually you have to give them a chance to start at that position. Um, but that versatility, you kind of always have to dabble in it um, until guys are uh, uh, in, in a situation where they, they own a spot um, and, and then the, the, their teammates have to be versatile. So I think what, what strikes me here is you can kind of put three guys in the bucket of unnecessary cross training, maybe four if you, if you count Isaiah Wynn, right? Teron Armstead, we know who Teron Armstead is. He's a left tackle. Austin Jackson, I think last season, earned the right to be a right tackle. Aaron Brewer, with his signing, coming in and, and being the first team center uh, and, and getting his opportunities exclusively at center. And then Isaiah Wynn is kind of like the wild card name here. Everybody else, everybody else fits into the second of those two buckets. And I think that that speaks well for the competition in those rooms. But I do think at some point, if there's not separation, you do wonder if the team 
will assess who they have uh, and choose to make a phone call somewhere else. And that's not to say that's the case because I, I have complimentary notes here on Liam Eikenberg. No, I didn't think he was a dominant player today by any means, but I thought he had good reps. I think he had okay reps, and I think he had reps that he probably liked that back. It was one of the better performances I've seen Liam have. I have Robert Jones. I, I have some good and some bad for Robert Jones. I have some good for Jack Driscoll. Isaiah Wynn's obviously not participating, but two of those three guys are are getting cross-trained with center and backup center, and you could kind of perceive them to maybe be in competition with one another for the primary utility offensive lineman role. So it's just interesting to hear Mike kind of say, instead of we want to let a young guy settle in and, and get a spot, we, we want the young guys to earn their spot on the team by having the versatility that we can rest easy knowing that there's multiplicity in the ways in which we can use them. So um, I think you probably put three guys in the do not disturb bucket and everybody else is kind of open. This isn't so much um, offensive line notes but it is a player that I had a chance to speak to in press availabilities, which is Jordan Brooks. His answer uh, to my question really impressed me. And that's where we're finishing today on this practice recap here on Locked on Dolphins. Stick with us. Going to the game is not supposed to be stressful. It's supposed to be fun to go see your favorite teams hopefully win. So if you're in the mood to head down to the ballpark and catch a Marlins game or wherever you're living, if it's not here in South Florida and go catch a major league baseball game, for example, get your tickets with game time. They take the guesswork out of buying tickets with last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and a lowest price guarantee. You could save up to 60% off buying last minutes for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more with flash deals and zone deals. And my favorite thing is the panoramic view. So you can know exactly what kind of sight lines you're getting with your tickets before you hit submit and buy those tickets and put them uh, from your cart into your phone because just a few taps tickets get delivered directly to your phone as well. Take the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NFL. For $20 off your first purchase, terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download game time today for last minute tickets with the lowest prices. Guaranteed. Jordan Brooks. Um, some nice moments in the first week of camp as a whole. I think he's been a, a very positive addition. And the linebacker room as a whole, I, I mentioned this on Joe Rose, has earlier this week has a chance, I think, to be one of the deeper positions uh, on the roster. You know, we had David Long start on PUP. He's back. We had uh, Anthony Walker who flashed in his absence, and now he's had a couple of vet rest days, and Jordan Brooks is here, and you still have Duke Riley, and you have Cam Brown, and you have Channing Tindall, and Tindall had a nice play on Devon A. Chan today where uh, he got outside and scraped with it, and I really like seeing that from Channing Tindall because you know what? Yesterday, Channing Tindall had the opportunity to make the exact same play, and he didn't take the angle. And he got beat to the edge. So to see him adjust from one day to the next and come back and take that angle and be in a position to take that contact, and credit to A-Chan, he took the hit like a champ. He stayed on his feet. And I know it's you're not going to the ground anyway, but it was a, a heavy thud. He thudded him pretty hard. Um, that stood out to me for Channing Tindall's purposes, but but Jordan Brooks – with all of the range, and we alluded to this a little earlier in our, some of our practice recaps as well, the body types that the Dolphins have up front with, let's see, I've got all the names here. It's Deshaun Hand and Neville Gallimore and Tier Tart and Calais Campbell and Zach Sealer and Benito Jones and Isaiah Mack. Like all these guys have flashed in a promising way in some way, shape, or form for, for big, dense guys up front. It's a lot of dudes to have in the rotation up front. We'll see who ends up making the team out of this group, but I, I do feel better about the high floor, particularly on early downs, of those guys playing for the Dolphins. Um, Jordan Brooks playing behind them. Jordan Brooks himself is new. 
They're learning a new scheme. Neville Gallimore is new. Tier Tart is new. Calais Campbell is new. Benito Jones is new. Isaiah Mack is new. With Anthony Weaver playing a new scheme. I asked Jordan Brooks his thoughts on how they can expedite the process of learning how to play off of one another. And his answer didn't necessarily give me what I expected he would, but it was an answer that impressed me nonetheless. Jordan, you're new here, new scheme, a lot of new guys in front of you on the defensive line. How's that process going for you guys all kind of feeling each other out to know how to play off of each other? And is there anything you can do off the practice field to kind of help that process go along? Yeah, you got to sit down and eat lunch with people. Uh, maybe even go to lunch with somebody outside the building. You got to do little things like that. I really pride myself on doing that, just really getting to know people on a personal level. Even if we never play with each other again, it's like, you know, we built that relationship. But just from experience, just playing ball for a number of years, like anybody you know on a personal level, you can play that much harder for them. You know, I, like I really know this guy, so I can really go to war with him when it gets tough in the fourth quarter. And that front seven, you know, the D-line, linebackers, really everybody, but really that front seven, we really got to be like this. And so, you know, that's something I try to emphasize a little bit more. Uh, in the past, I haven't been great with it. Just kind of being reserved, but just kind of just sitting next to guys and just picking their brain. Does that also lend to like? So, I know the audio quality wasn't as as sharp on that one, but if you guys couldn't hear it well, he said, you know, I, I to to get on the same page with uh, how to play off each other. You got to sit down and go to lunch with somebody, right? Is that necessarily where your your mind first goes? But the overall point being um, there has to be a, a cohesiveness and a want. And w- when that question got expanded on later in the press availability, Jordan Brooks talked about, he was asked about uh, being able to have difficult conversations with guys. And he says, you know, if if, if somebody that I don't know or I don't trust – comes to me or comes at me and says, you know, the way I played something wasn't right, or I need to change how I play something. And that, that relationship is not there. You see, you see guys whose reaction to that is, I don't know you like that. Why are you talking to me like this? Whereas if the relationship is there, everybody has the trust that those difficult conversations are being had because it's the way to directly address and correct whatever went wrong so that that way the relationship of the unit and the performance of the unit can be better. So I know I got on my soapbox earlier uh, this past week and and talked about these guys not being Madden avatars and the human element of the game. So to get Jordan Brooks, and and I I said that off of Kendall Lamb, uh, what he told me last week uh, as far as his preparation and his process and um, to have Jordan Brooks come out. It's just a really cool follow-up to that in a completely different question to say, you know, us getting on the same page and trusting each other with how we play off of each other with everybody being new requires everybody to, to be outgoing and put themselves outside of their comfort zone uh, to be proactive in, in getting to know the people and spending the extra time with the people. Uh, not burying my nose in the playbook and getting how it works because you'll talk through how you're going to play off of different looks and different combinations. If they double team you in front of me, I know how you're going to anchor it based on how your body language looks. And I know I can either go under that and make the play or I'm going to have to bubble and go over the top. And then the other linebacker who's out there with me is going to have to understand that he's going to have to fit the backside gap off that double team because I got to go and get over top of it, right? Like that just being an example of how the run front mechanic works, but him talking about the front seven as a whole, the cohesiveness of that unit with their proximity to the ball uh, in the run game, it's, it's paramount. So it was really neat to hear Jordan Brooks talk about how he's taking that individual ownership himself as a player. The dolphins have a lot invested in you know, they, this. This is a player that got a three year contract, uh, almost valued at $9 million per season. And he's looked great in the first week in camp. But what he does with that opportunity to know that in his mind, he's got to go out there and proactively be more connected with his teammates so that the trust exists 
for the hard conversations to take place to make corrective measures so that you don't have miscommunications in how you're fitting runs is all very, very cool. And it's, again, another healthy reminder that uh, these are people that are trying to get this done, right? And uh, that's why there is the emphasis on who you put into your locker room. And it seems like the Dolphins got a lot of good guys, even when they fight amongst themselves at the end of practice, as they did today on Tuesday, July 30th, our one-week measure of training camp for the 2024 season. The team is off tomorrow. I am not. You will get me with another show coming your way tomorrow. I look forward to bringing it your way. You can keep it locked in right here on Locked On Dolphins is your team every day. I appreciate you guys. Check out the show. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Fins up.